through. There are over 200 of you here expressing your enthusiasm for uh, Mrs. Howard and for Twickenham and for the culture of this region. Twickenham is a, is a sort of blessed spot on the map, isn't it? So without further ado, let me welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Megan Leyland. We're, we're really delighted to have her here. She's an absolute expert on the subject, both of, um, of Mrs. Howard and on uh, women as collectors and patrons and uh, brilliant people in the 18th century. A little bit about her. She joined English Heritage as a senior properties historian in 2015 and since then has worked on a range of research and interpretation projects across the charity's portfolio. However, the first site she started working on after joining and the subject of her talk today was Marble Hill. Her continuing research on Marble Hill feeds into a wider research interest in the role of women in shaping the architecture of their homes in the 18th and 19th centuries. Over to you, Megan. Thank you very much and thank you for that um, kind introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this uh, lecture series today. And um, as we've heard, I'm going to be talking about um, the second of the homes along um, the River Thames in Twickenham. And that is Marble Hill, an 18th century villa nestled on the banks of the River Thames. And you can see it here with the river um, gently flowing in front on a rather nice day, quite like um, we've had today. And Marble Hill has an incredible story to tell about the life of a remarkable woman, Henrietta Howard, Countess of Sussex. She is perhaps best known as the mistress of the Prince of Wales, later George II, but I hope you will agree with me by the end of this talk that she was a remarkable woman in her own right and a fascinating historical figure. Arguably, her greatest achievement was the building of Marble Hill, and here we have it in all its glory. Built in the 1720s, it was designed as a retreat from the Georgian court and the hustle and bustle of London and a place to entertain Henrietta's intellectual, cultural and political circle of friends. Um, and among them were Alexander Pope, the poet, and Horace Walpole, both subjects of our upcoming lectures, so I won't talk too much about them today. Um, but really, to understand the importance of Marble Hill, to understand its significance and, and what it meant for Henrietta Howard, we have to understand a little bit about her, her life leading up to her arrival there and leading up to its construction. And here she is in a beautiful painting um, from 1724, which hangs at Marble Hill. Henrietta was born in 1689 and she was born to the Hobart family, a titled and respected family, and lived at Blickening Hall. However, the death of her parents um, and indebted family state meant that at a young age, she really was in difficult circumstances. And perhaps with the hope of finding some security, a better future, she married a distant kinsman, Charles Howard, in 1706, and soon thereafter had her only child. However, her hopes of any security were sadly disappointed. He was described as ill-tempered, obstinate, drunken and extravagant. And Charles' bad habit, violent temper, um, left Henrietta really in quite dire circumstances, in fear of creditors and indeed in fear for her own safety at points in her life. Before long, she was pretty much penniless with no family left to turn to. And as Lord Chesterfield, her friend, summed up, Thus they were married and thus they hated each other for the rest of their lives. And Lord Chesterfield is actually a resident of another English heritage property, Ranger's House, and they have quite a fun correspondence between themselves. So Henrietta didn't give in to these circumstances. She looked for a way out of poverty and she raised some funds. And with her husband, she traveled to the Hanoverian court. So that was the home of the future kings and queens of England. And they would inherit the British throne. And this decision paid off. In 1741, George I ascended to the throne, ushering in the Georgian era, and Henrietta returned um, with the, the royal party as a woman of the bedchamber of his daughter-in-law, uh, Princess of Wales, later Queen Caroline. And her husband um, became um, a groom of the bedchamber to George I. And here we have the wonderful uh, portrait of George II, again, um, at Marble Hill. And in the early years of court life, 
Henrietta became the mistress of the Prince of Wales, later George II, who you see here. Courtier Lord Harvey described how the Prince spent, quote, every evening of his life, three or four hours in Mrs. Howard's lodgings, and described the nature of their relationship as one of a man who seemed to look upon the mistress rather as a necessary part of his grandeur as a prince, and I quote, um, not as an addition to um, his, or less as an addition to his pleasures as a man. I will leave you to interpret that as you see. Now, Henrietta's position as a royal mistress and in uh, the bedchamber of um, Queen uh, Princess, uh, Princess of Wales, later Queen Caroline, offered her a route out of poverty and a degree of protection from her husband, who was in the household of the king. It also enabled her to forge an independent life of her own the setting of which would be the home she built, Marble Hill. And here we have the lovely um, Horace Walpole, Henrietta's friend in her later life and fellow Thames resident. Um, and he wrote that Marble Hill was built, and I quote here, by King George II for Henrietta Howard, his mistress, and cost the king 10 or 12,000 pounds. Now, this needs to be taken with a little bit of salt, a pinch of salt. It's a little bit more complicated than this. And it perhaps conceals um, the importance of Marble Hill as Henrietta's home and Marble Hill as her creation. In 1723, the Prince of Wales did make a gift to Henrietta of £11,500 stock in trust, including investments in the Bank of England and the South Sea Company, South Sea Company being um, heavily involved in the, the slave trade at the time. He also gave her jewels, plates, mahogany and furniture. That a royal mistress might benefit from what was effectively a semi-official court position is not actually that surprising. Though it is interesting to note that Henrietta's friend again, Walpole, um, said that no established mistress of the sovereign ever enjoyed less of the brilliancy of the situation than they did. Significantly, this gift and the settlement um, that, that gave it to her stated it was to the end, intent and purpose that some provision and way of living may be made for the said Henrietta Howard, which Charles Howard, that's her awful husband, won't have anything to do with. He can't, he can't get his hands on it. The gift was evidently to help Henrietta gain a degree of freedom, a degree of financial independence, and it was put in a trust to protect it from her husband. And you've got to remember at the time, in the eyes of common law, uh, a married woman had no real legal existence. So on marriage, everything she owned became that of her husband. And as the often quoted judge William Blackstone put it, by marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law, but it's the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended. However, Henrietta's separate wealth provided by this gift, a newfound sort of security, um, gave her an ability to engage in building and architecture in a way which perhaps many other women weren't able to at the time. And so soon after this gift, it's no coincidence that Henrietta started building Marble Hill. And here we have um, a beautiful image of Marble Hill as it was in around 1749. Really gives you an idea of what it was like on the river at the time with boats passing by um, and the lovely landscape which came down to it. The plans were afoot for the construction of a new home, Marble Hill a house and garden which Henrietta would continue to develop throughout her lifetime. In this period, the stretch of the river took on a, a, a new character, a distinctive character, as an earthly Elysium or paradise, or the echoes of ancient Italy found in its flowing river. The writer Henrietta Pye wrote in 1760, the whole place is one continued garden, and later noted, the genius of its inhabitants inclines not towards commerce, architecture seems their chief delight. And Henrietta certainly made her mark in that long garden and um, certainly delighted in the architecture which she built. The home she constructed was inspired by the architecture of the 16th century Italian architect Andrea Palladio and was built in the Palladian style. So this is a style which is concerned with symmetry, proportion, and you can see this really well in the great room at Marble Hill. I mean, this is the showpiece. This is where Henrietta would have entertained the great and good of society. And if you take away the coving on the top, it's a perfect cube, very satisfying. And adjoining it are symmetrical rooms, a bedchamber and dressing chamber. 
And then if you go downstairs directly below the Great Room, you find the Tetrastyle Hall and you can see the beautiful views that Henrietta would have had out to the river. And this was where guests would have entered either by river or by road. And they may have dined, played cards, waited to see Henrietta herself. And it's based on um, or inspired by the central court of a Roman house where there would have been a basin of water in the middle. And you can see where the columns would have marked that out. Her home was accompanied by a garden inspired by classical literature and the gardens of ancient Rome. And which through recent research, we've learned an awful lot more about than we've ever known through a plan from, 17, uh, from around 1749. And do have a look on our website because you can look at it in a bit more detail there. Among the features included are a greenhouse, as one correspondent wrote, where Marble Hill's inhabitants might lay their lazy limbs. There's a, a night in bowling alley, briefly fashionable at the time. Um, there's terracing, which imitates the shape of an amphitheatre. And to help her build her home, Henrietta had no shortage of knowledgeable acquaintances. In fact, there were perhaps more on hand than she needed. Uh, Lord Peterborough, or as he termed himself, Henrietta's unfortunate gardener and architect complained, I dislike my rivals amongst the living. More than those amongst the dead must I yield to Lord Herbert and Lord Ely, who were other members of Henrietta's network involved in the design. And it was really common in the period to draw on the skills and knowledge of those in your sort of social network to build this, this design, this idea for your home. Friend Lord Ely, you, he was a trustee of the gifts He's on bills, helping her pay for things, probably as he was in his position as trustee in the seat. You've got names such as the architect Earl Henry Herbert, Knight Earl of Pembroke. He's also paying for bills, but sometimes it's quite hard to trace his, his influence and design, but Swift and Walpole were sure he was the architect. And the builder was Roger Morris, who also worked for the royal family and likely contributed to matters of design. In the garden, the hands of the future royal gardener, Charles Bridgman, and the poet Alexander Pope can be found. And you see the scribblings of designs and plans um, which led up to its creation. And I'm not going to go into the detail about what everyone did, but I think it's safe to say that Henrietta drew on some of the, the great minds of the time. And that's really a skill in itself to be admired. In building her new home on the banks of the River Thames between Hampton Court and Kew, Henrietta placed herself at the heart of an influential cultural, political and artistic hub. And we'll hear more about those in the next two lectures um, as you come about, no doubt, because they were also part of this circle. Marble Hill was a close, and especially close, to the Royal Court by River, and she was still a woman of the bedchamber while she was building, um, but could also provide a haven from the tricky to navigate relationships and politics of the Royal Household. Remember, she was in the household of the future Queen Caroline as mistress um, to the future George II. But, as Walpole puts it, Marble Hill provided Harrant with an elegant retreat. So we've arrived at Marble Hill, and I want to briefly pause to go back to Henrietta. What did building this mean for her? What, what was going on in her life at the time? We remember, we still got Charles Howard in the background, her awful husband. By the time she was building Marble Hill, Henrietta and her husband were living apart. And by 1727, Henrietta was not only building her house, but she was building a case for a legal separation from her husband, which she successfully gained soon after. This was a rare step for the time. Women were really sort of encouraged to stay in marriages, however bad they might be. And I think it's fair to say for Henrietta, the relationship with her husband by this point was over. I think it's really interesting because building Marble Hill was a statement of her taste, position, and also a bold step and statement of her relationship, perhaps, with her husband. It also maybe suggested that there was a life for Henrietta after the court um, in her older years. And the fact that perhaps she didn't want her husband to hear about it has been um, suggested from a quote um, when she's writing to the dramatist John Gay, and I'll put it up here. And she says to him, I beg you will never mention the plan, and that's probably plans for Marble Hill from the timing, um, which she found in my room. There's a necessity yet to keep that whole affair secret. I think I may tell you, it's almost entirely finished to my satisfaction. The construction of Marble Hill then was perhaps a recognition that that marriage was over. Building a um, home, as I've said, was a really bold statement. And it also marks Henrietta out as an important example of a female patron or builder in the Georgian era, reminding us that amongst all the great 
um, men that we hear who are building at the time, there were women also constructing homes for themselves and they could equally be interested in architecture and design. She was up to date with the latest fashions and tastes in architecture and garden design. And though we perhaps see more evidence of those, um, some of those other people I've mentioned in the design, I don't think we should um, write Henrietta off as having her own say. You know, she's writing to go saying it's, satisfied, uh, it's finished to her satisfaction, so she's obviously interested. And so I want to just, just divert momentarily to think a little bit about Henrietta and her intellectual interests, her interest in garden and design, and how perhaps she had her say on what is now heralded as a textbook example of Palladian architecture, architecture concerned with symmetry and proportion of time. Henrietta probably was able to develop a really quite good understanding of building design throughout her lifetime. She was in the household of Queen Caroline, known for her own interests. And a letter which I really quite enjoy from a fellow courtier, Mary Campbell from August 1724, perhaps attests to this. She wrote, how does my good Howard do? Methinks I long to hear from you. But I suppose you're up to ears and bricks and mortar and talks of frieze and cornice like any little woman. And then she talks about going to um, a friend's house, um, Fane's house, and this is the house here, another perfect example of Palladian architecture, where she's going to improve herself in the terms of art in order to keep up pace with you in the winter. Otherwise, I know how she'll make but a scurvy figure in your room. And perhaps Mary was going to arm herself with the latest knowledge on Palladian design, so that when she went and visited Henrietta and heard about her project, she could join in. And it's not actually hard to conjure an image of intellectual, artistic and architectural conversation taking place in Henrietta's lodgings where those plans were found. And that, the image I showed you earlier, this is um, Marble Hill, not quite as built, and it's from a, uh, a book called Vitruvius Britannicus, written by one of the leading proponents of that Palladian style I mentioned. Um, and it has plates of houses in it. And this is a house in Twickenham and is a version of Marble Hill. And Henrietta was one of a handful of female subscribers amongst hundreds of men um, to this publication. And it probably sat on her mahogany bookshelves at Marble Hill, along with all her other books and others to do with architecture she subscribed to. There are also hints of her acting as a source of knowledge within her social network. She recommended Charles Bridgman, who worked on her gardeners, to the Duchess of Queensbury, and I couldn't help myself but put her in, in her beautiful pastoral attire. And she was a fan of Marble Hill. She wrote, I had wings like a dove. Oh, had I wings like a dove? It'd be amazing if she had wings. But then would I fly away to Marble Hill and be at rest? And I think that's how many people perhaps feel about coming to the wonderful people Marble Hill um, today. And she advises her nephew. She writes to Lord Chesterfield, who was at Ranger's house, who we heard about earlier about the proportions of his ballroom. And that women could attain this knowledge through visiting, reading, and conversation is perhaps not surprising. There are also glimpses in correspondence to suggest Henrietta kept an eye and perhaps contributed to the building of Marble Hill and its evolution over time. Uh, the previously mentioned quote from 1723 about designs being done to her satisfaction. A meeting in 1724 at Marble Hill between Henrietta, the poet Alexander Pope, and the royal gardener Charles Bridgman to discuss the garden and hints in the correspondence about that that followed. She was later in the 1730s, once again, um, all absorbed in things building. She was head over ears in shells, no doubt to decorate her grotto, and which is probably a slightly later addition to Marble Hill and is still um, there in some form today. She was also writing to friends to get things for the interiors and they were writing to her about things they found that she might like. She's writing to one in Florence asking to bring things back. The Earl of Essex in the 1730s, they're writing about importing fabric. And it's the subject of another paper, but Henrietta was a prolific collector of porcelain. And you have to imagine Marble Hill cluttered with these pieces. She even had a dedicated china room, sadly now demolished, in which to display them. In her later life, this interest seems to have continued. In the 1750s and 60s, she's designed two square towers of a Gothic farm or folly that was in the garden, sadly no longer there, um, under the supervision of Horace Walpole. So I hope you won't mind my diversion there. But I think it's safe to say that Henrietta had a great um, interest and ability to draw people together. And though she's sometimes hard to find, um, she seems kind of ever present in the building of this also important home to her. 
And it's notable that from 1728, those bills which, and receipts which might have been addressed to her friends become addressed to her. This is after she has separated from her husband. And I think that's sometimes quite often the problem with finding women's voice in these stories that they sometimes conceal um, elsewhere. Um, so the final payment for Marble Hill to Roger Morris and for the construction was made in 1729. By this time, things were looking up. Henrietta had separated from her husband. In 1731, she was made Countess of Suffolk on the death of her brother-in-law. And in the same year, she wrote, everything is yet promises more happiness for the later part of my life than have yet, I've yet had a prospect of. It'd be 10 years before Henrietta left the royal household and left the royal court. It was 1734 that she really began to enjoy Marble Hill to her full its full potential, though her friends were certain, her was certainly there at points um, um, uh, prior to that. And Marble Hill became known as Henrietta's, a centre for Henrietta's cultural circle. And I like to think, imagine what the kind of conversations would have been inside Marble Hill and what it would have been like being part of that circle. And you kind of get a hint of it in surviving letters between everyone in that network, the politicians and the authors, and um, the playful letters which they, they pass between each other, and the wonderful poetry that survived from some of those authors in her group, a poem by Pope about her dog Fop and his dog Bounce and the merits of court and country life and his poem, A Certain Lady at Court, where he describes her as an equal mixture of good humour and sensible soft melancholy. Or perhaps Jonathan Swift's pointed pastoral dialogue written while Marble Hill was being built, which explains, sing on I must and sing I will of Richmond Lodge, royal residence in Marble Hill. And maybe that's a, a taste of some of the intellectual and literary conversation that went on. By 1735, after Henrietta had left court, Pope wrote, there is a greater court now at Marble, um, greater court now at Marble Hill than at Kensington, and God knows when it will end. And she's rivaling the royals here, perhaps. For Henrietta, this was not only a place for entertaining, though. It was the location of a second life, a life after court, and she took a second chance on marriage by the time she was no longer mistress um, to George II. She was, her husband died in 1733. She was widowed. And she married the politician George Barclay. And you look at their letters, and you really see that this finally was a loving and companionate relationship. You know, you see my love, my soul, my joy, and it's, and it's really lovely to read. And at Marble Hill, they also brought up their uh, Henrietta's niece and nephew, so perhaps having a second chance at the family life. The domestic bliss could not, however, last forever. George died in 1746, and once again, um, Henrietta's life was spared. And it's in the 21 years, she lived a long time after this, that she draws in new people to her social circle, including Horace Walpole. So if you listen to one of our lectures coming up uh, later in the week, you can hear more about him. And he would sit and listen to her reminiscing about court life. And she was quite hard of hearing from an early age, actually, so she had an ear trumpet. And he records a lot of this, and that's where a lot of our information um, comes from. She also once again looked after one of the younger members of her family. Her niece, also called Henrietta, so we quite often call her Little Henrietta to differentiate, came to live at Marble Hill. And her letters provide a fascinating glimpse into life at Marble Hill and also 18th century childhood. I think some things probably never change. And she uh, had her bedroom in this room, which is would have been a dressing room attached to Henrietta's bedchamber. And she writes to her parents about decorating the grotto in the garden, about embroidery, sitting, meditating in the grounds, and possibly one of my favourite um, quotes from Marble Hill. You get a real sense of her sense of humour where she goes, I can grunt like a hog, quack like a duck, sing like a cuckoo, but old fool, being Henrietta of course, observes this is only proper whilst I am a spinster. And you have these wonderful visions of her when she doesn't want to go to bed and she doesn't want to wear her nighty and things like that. And it um, gives you a whole different side, perhaps to Marble Hill, as well as that wonderful literary and cultural and political side um, of people visiting there. Henrietta's life came to an end at her beloved home in Marble Hill and this is her bedchamber in 1767. And I'm more or less going to leave her story there. Although Henrietta is primarily known as mistress to George II, it is evident that she was a remarkable woman in her own right. And as historians before me have argued to trace Ormond Judith Bryant, she was more than a mistress. 
Her ability to navigate the challenges that life threw at her is testament to her tenacity and intelligence and resourcefulness. Her ability to navigate, oh, said that one. She was also a patron of architecture, um, the decorative arts, letters, poetry. She was an, a great collector of people, from poets to politicians. Her legacy is a beautiful marble hill which stands as testament to her hard fought for independence, her intelligence and diverse and far reaching interests. And she is someone I have really loved learning about and I hope you have too. But before I finish, I want to briefly transport us back to the present um, and let you know that English Heritage is currently undertaking a project with the award of the grant from the National Lottery. And among other things, um, we're representing and conserving the house and the landscape. We're going to interpret and do justice to the stories of Henrietta Howard, we're updating the facilities. And um, although Marble Hill is currently closed, I hope you will join us when we are open to learn more about Henrietta's life. In the meantime, we have a fantastic series of events in the park. So do have a look at our website, which I've put up on the screen here. Um, and you can also find out more about the project and some great talks coming up shortly. So with that, I will say thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you've had some questions in the question box and pass back over um, to Judith. Um, yeah, thank you very much indeed, Megan. I don't know if people can uh, see and hear me now. What a fantastic talk. I mean, I thought I knew about um, Mar you know, Marble Hill House and uh, Henrietta Howard, but I learned so much more from that uh, fascinating insight into her, into her life and her works. This, she's a, an extraordinary woman. Um, I'm, some people were arriving during the course of your talk, and I know some people have been there from the start, but, but bear with me. I just want to remind people how they can ask a question. I've had about, um, oh, about 10 questions in already, but for those of you who, who, who do want to ask a question, um, you have, you're muted and we don't have the hands up function working, so you have to put it in the chat function. And if you haven't found that yet, if you move your cursor around, uh, a bar of sort of tools will appear and one of them is labelled chat. Click on that and um, select me, my name's Judith Hawley, and type in your question. And um, I'll pick some out. I mean, the questions are coming in thick and fast. So um, I, I hope to get to some of you. If you have to leave, you can just quietly slip away. I understand you might have a gin and tonic waiting, something like that, or, or something, you know, something really pressing. Um, but if you want to stay, we'll probably run on for another quarter of an hour at least. So I've had a, a, a number of questions in and I'm going to pick, pick them out in what I think is, is so far as a, as a fairly logical order. Uh, one question is about the name Marble Hill. Did um, Henrietta choose it herself? Where did it come from? Uh, she did not choose it. It comes from a field name, Marble Hall. Um, so it, though it does kind of suitably look this white marble <laughs> building, alas, uh, it's from a field name. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. And then uh, the first question that came in, I think, is a, is a lovely one. It's about um, transport on the river. And I, I think that the, the location on the river is one of the, the reasons why Twickenham became this sort of mm. valley of, of, of villas. And somebody wanted to know whether guests would have arrived by boat. Um, did uh, um, Henrietta own all the land down to the river? And did she have a boathouse? So about the, the practicalities of transport. Mm. So in the early years, Henrietta didn't own all the land down to the river, so she didn't initially have a place for people to dismount from their boats and, and come up to Marble Hill. And she, she, that, that came later um, as she developed her grounds. Um, but undoubtedly, in spite of that, people would have still come by river um, along, along what now we have the towpath. It's a little bit different now um, to how it looks. And actually, I think the importance of the river is such a great point not only for transporting people there but you get little uh, notes in the archive of her sending things she had a london house as well for sending bits um, from marble hill uh, the produce she grew there you know this would have had a sort of um uh, an estate which supported that entertaining with food it has an ice house for your ice which you you would have got ready for your syllabubs and and whatever and sending it to london um so and and also from a design point of view the river is really important it's that sort of 
uh, evocation of Italian villas with the water below. And it, Marble Hill is definitely designed to be viewed from the river as well as from the road as you come in. So yes, yeah. people, people would, have, would have come both ways and it's kind of got two faces, Marble Hill, actually. Right. There's not quite a front or a back face because they both would have been used as entrances. Right. I've got quite a lot of questions about um, uh, her visitors and I want to, to pick up on that uh, in a moment. I'll, mm. I'll go through some of those. But I want to ask one more question uh, about her personally. Uh, one uh, listener has asked, she, she had a hearing impairment, didn't she? And do you know how she came by that impairment and, and how she coped? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting because you can find the traces of, of that and the impact on her in her correspondence. And it's always hard to recover an experience in the past um, of, of the extent of that. And it seems to have been something that she was um, dealing with from quite an early age, from her late 20s, early 30s. She had crippling headaches as well. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, she's, it's hard to say, she's often described as, as someone who sort of sit back and could take in everything in the world. And you kind of wonder whether she's sort of and slowly pondering what's going on around her and whether the fact she perhaps in the hustle and bustle of court life couldn't quite hear everything that was going on, hard to say, um, and we don't know. But it must have been really troubling for her because she went to the extent of um, having some form of surgery. She had her jaw bored. Um, I don't think medics today would advise it as a cure for headaches and hearing loss. Um, but I think that kind of shows the, the extent to which perhaps it, it, it did trouble her in life but she did carry on and she became this this great converser and intellectual and part of court life so thank you um another personal question uh, somebody wants to know whether any of um her clothes survive oh i have never come across any mm. um we have that lovely portrait of henrietta which is quite a romantic looking portrait which suggests something of her appearance but i have if anyone has come across them, I'd be very interested to know. But no, I haven't. Um, and yeah. there is a lock of her hair uh, oh. in Lambeth Palace archives. I believe have a lock of hair, which is kind of unusual. That was a surprise. Um, oh. no <laughs> and more about her, her possessions, because taste is obviously so important to her, to, to her self-identity. Um, uh, why was her special china room demolished? actually demolished in the 20th century it's interesting um it seems to have been perhaps a garden building beautifully painted um and and for her china and it seems to have at some point been absorbed into the service range which equally is is now demolished so those of you who might know marble hill directly to one side uh, where the orchard um was um there's there was a service sort of l-shaped service range across and um, so so sadly uh demolished reasonably uh, recently um, but it would have been I should have imagined quite the spectacle she sort of showed off to her friends how it would shock she said, love my Chinese room shock you have how wonderful and vibrant it is <laughs> we, we heard about um, Nella's China collecting yeah yesterday in the talk that was lovely um, and a little bit more about um, her, her taste again um, a very interesting question about her interest in Palladian architecture. Mm. Did she ever travel to Italy to see the architecture in situ uh, or was she working from British examples, her friends inspirations? Yeah it's quite interesting because um, I suspect a lot of women who engaged with it at the time and fortunately by this period you have lots of books and things coming around as well you have a lot of your gentleman friends will have gone on grand tours and seen it and Henrietta didn't travel until a bit later in her life with her second husband where she went over to Europe so I would have imagined that she would have learned about it at Hanover in the Hanoverian court she would have learned about it there and she would have learned about it in the court back here and through this network of acquaintances she had um, and you know it's, it's, it's not surprising in many ways that an aristocratic woman could learn about these things through reading, writing, conversing, visiting other houses at the time. So um, yeah it's, it's perhaps in many ways not surprising that she may have developed an interest. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and we've got some questions about her, her relationship with the, the, uh, the royal couple. Um, Henrietta was sent to Hanover to improve George's English. Is there any evidence that she managed this? I don't know. I don't know. I haven't got an answer for you on that one. Um, 
but yeah interesting I don't know <laughs> and then then what about her relationship with Queen Caroline there's a, a question here about um, whether she stayed in touch with Queen Caroline obviously she sort of drifted apart from George II or had the severance but and, and Queen Caroline was such an important promoter of women's intelligence and taste and judgment and choices yeah that's quite an interesting question and I I I don't know how much she would have kept in touch with her you know once she'd left the royal court I mean she left the court perhaps not on the best terms um with the royal couple I think um mm. George by that time had had a, had enough of her and he wrote some rather horrible things you know he's fed up of this deaf old peevish bat I think he says you know it's, it's not the best terms to leave on and she was sort of caught up in this um potential scandal for going and seeing um of members of the of opposition politicians uh, down in Bath and in terms of Caroline I think she was Henrietta was probably someone that was a case of better the devil you know kind of situation she's in her household and Henrietta's very known for being very discreet she's called the Swiss um, and she's known for sort of managing these social relationships and things so I think um, Though it may have been a, a curious relationship to be in the household of one member of a marriage and a mistress to the other, uh, they certainly managed to navigate it in ways. But you know, in terms of later on, um, I'm not so sure about how much they kept in touch. Um, interesting question. Yeah. And there's some other good questions about um, her friends and, and visitors. Uh, one, one question wants to know whether her visitors and friends would just arrive without invitation or would they be expected to receive an invitation first? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I kind of, there's a bit of me that thinks with that sort of Twickenham set, as they become known, and they're prominent in Henrietta's time at Marble Hill in the earlier years of her life, while she's potentially going between court and her home. You kind of get a sense from a few things that they kind of made Marble Hill a bit of their home. They're talking about being there when Henrietta's not. And, and eating some food and naming one of their cows that is born and, and things like that. And you kind of get that feeling that perhaps they, there may have been a degree of openness. But equally, there would have been that sense of going around and, and um, leaving cards and things to visit people and come back and forth. Um, but I, in terms of whether they could just turn up and expect a welcome, perhaps. <laughs> and another question about one of... Um... Her, her friends and which then leads on to the the, the, the larger topic of, um, of her gardens and her knowledge of gardening. Um, how did Horace Walpole, her great friend and neighbour at Strawberry Hill and a keen garden historian, describe Howard's extensive pleasure gardens? Oh, how did he describe them? I can't, oh, he does do a lovely poem about Twickenham more generally as the seat of the muses and Henrietta coming and residing at her elegant retreat. Um, and their friendship's really quite an interesting one. And I think in many ways, he was as much fascinated with her knowledge of court life and everything as much as probably Marble Hill. And he did actually, um, I think it was printed at the Strawberry Hill Press, print a poem by another one of Henrietta's circle and Chambers on Marble Hill about the grotto, which gives us a great description that we hadn't had before of this sort of beautiful place. So whether he explicitly says whether he likes it or not, I've not seen it. Yeah, actually your mention of the, the grotto um, reminds me that there is a, a question specifically about the grotto. Could you tell us more about it? What went on there? How is it decorated? And, and that sort of leads into the more uh, general questions about the renovation plans. I wonder if you can tell yeah. us more about that. Um, so the grotto you see today, if any of you have visited, does not have the beautiful glitz and glamour perhaps that it, it once had in its day. It would have been adorned with shell, coral, um, rock work and things like. And during an excavation, ooh, I think it was, and we found quite a lot of this. And it's been really interesting because we've gone through the bits and pieces that would have once, once adorned the walls of the grotto to think about things like, where did it come from? The coral and the shells. We came from the Caribbean and is transported and stuck on these walls of this grotto at Marble Hill. And it would have been a place um, sort of to sit and enjoy being outdoors and for contemplation, perhaps. And, I, and I've got Anne Chambers' poem 
um, in front of me and, and talking about, it talks about birds speak from bow to bow and converse, howl, I know not how. And they enter into high debate and the best place to go and do it is in the grotto. Um, so it would have been a, a place um, to come and enjoy orange trees and she goes, their orange trees sweet odours send with flowers their loaded branches bend. So you can kind of imagine this wonderful setting. They scatter their books. So and gives us this wonderful education of, of, of what that grotto might have been like in, in its day and in its, its glory. Um, and then into the second part of that question about our plans for Marble Hill. Um, so Marble Hill Revived is a project funded by the uh, National Lottery. And we are basically giving the house some serious TLC and representing it to really bring it back to how it might have felt in Henrietta's day. And we're going to reinterpret that and, and tell her stories there um, through some new bits of interpretation. But the house wasn't designed in isolation. It was designed with the gardens which surround it, which are now um, a public park um, and which many people still enjoy today. And as you walk around, you can still see the traces of a designed landscape with avenues of trees going down to the river, an oval lawn where she might have sat and ate, um, with uh, the arcades of trees that you have walked through. And I think Swift in his poem says lovely things about if trees could talk, if walls could talk, things like that, what stories they might tell. And you can still see the traces of that. And what we're doing with the project is we've done lots of research on the landscape. We've done archaeological excavations to better understand um, the bits which perhaps need sharpening up and tweaking to bring it back to um, its glory. And we're going to be doing that. So works have already started at Marble Hill. So for those of you who are local, you may have seen um, bits and pieces being done in the landscape. I have to admit, I haven't been there since all this lockdown began. So I'm looking forward to going and having a look and seeing how it's how it's evolved so far. Good. Um, thinking about the um, the interior of the house as well, I mean that that idea of the house being designed in situ. This is very much my sense of Alexander Pope, which I'll be mm. talking about uh, later later this week. Um, and you showed that lovely uh, image of the view from within the hall out and that interest i'm interested in that relation between the inside and out and one of our questioners has asked uh, to what extent are the historic interiors including paintings ceramics etc still in situ sadly a lot of the the natives so the original collection of henrietta's at marble hill is no longer there uh, she did try and tell the estate that everything stayed together uh, but later on in the 19th century it was marble hill was sold and the collections would have been dispersed that said, curators over the years have done a fantastic job of trying to trace down the collections. We have an inventory from um, around Henrietta's death which tell us what was there. And so they've done a job and they've brought back um, a beautiful peacock um, here table. We've got a lacquer screen which would have been Henrietta's. And then the rest is sort of pieces which are kind of appropriate of the time. Um, and you know we've we've done bits with the interiors as well. And many of you have um, perhaps visited and seen the dining room. We've recreated this beautiful Chinese wallpaper that would have been there. And in keeping with her passion for China, she loved shinoazuri, which was a taste for the sort of Orient at the time. And she put this on her wall. She imported papers from Canton, and they would have cost a lot of money and taken a lot of time to put up. So we have some reproductions there. So you do get a sense of the interiors, but sadly. Um, some of her collection, or well, a lot of her collection, is no longer there. And if anyone has any, let us know. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> that does answer some of the questions that people have been asking about what happened to her china and her possessions. There's a question also about um, whether uh, her daughter owned the house, owned the house after her death. Um, so her, it was her great niece who um, came, little Henrietta, who does the rather entertaining letters. Um, she did eventually inherit, she didn't inherit straight away, and she was sort of the second person to inherit Marble Hill afterwards. And she lived um, in, at Marble Hill until 1816, but she didn't really live in the house. There was a smaller house on the estate called Little Marble Hill, um, where she lived. Um, so even though she'd sort of been brought up there um, as a child, she, she chose rather to live in a smaller residence. And, you know, you see a succession of tenants come to Marble Hill over the next generations. Um, a lot of them, interestingly, are women. So um, you get this wonderful continuation of it being a woman's house. <laughs> yeah. So th that, that's interesting, isn't it? Then there are several questions about that, um, 
her relationship to to other women and women's place and culture near mm. little marble hill it's like the displacement of the woman into this uh smaller world and and after um after so little henrietta takes little marble hill house who moved into marble hill itself oh gosh uh there are a number of tenants and i honestly can't remember all their names off the top of my head um but then it did pass through the generations until in 1824 it was sold off um and um it eventually passed sold to one person and then almost instantly after went to the peel family um and that's jonathan peel um and his wife alicia who actually lived there i think longer than anyone else so we have another woman and she seems to be known as quite hostess as well so the story sort of continued all the way into the 19th century which is kind of wonderful yeah um it's an interesting question about how um that legacy of Henrietta or, or rather the sort of the pushing to one side of her was she written out of the enlightenment you know, is there a sense that she was very important for a moment and then mm. dropped and forgotten about and 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 if so how was she rediscovered really interesting question and I think I think how Henrietta has been interpreted and understood both in her time and in more recent generations is quite an interesting one because you get actually quite a few descriptions of Henrietta from the time through her so social circle, some of them during disagreements with members, so you get some quite pointed poetry and commentary on what she was like. Um, and it ranges from, you know, she's described as a woman of reason, never uh, raved out of pride or gay out of season, to perhaps someone who's not that amazing, I think, and her intellectual pursuits weren't spectacular. And so you get these quite often conflicting views of her at the time. And you also struggle a little bit with her in as you do with quite often with women that um a lot of sort of things for building in particular um because of the way she procured her wealth and it was in trust would be through her male sort of properties at the time and she's she's an interesting one because she she counts among some of the fascinating women in the 18th century and in many ways she's kind of quite early to that sort of what we think of later as blue stocking sort of, of of women and then um you know marble hill has stood there as her legacy and there has been some great work done over her over the generations um by various um historians who have sort of recovered her story um judith bryant did some great stuff um he did a i think in the 80s there was a fantastic exhibition which used that woman of reason as, mm -hmm. as the title and the biographer um, and historian Tracy Borman has done a fantastic biography of Henrietta which I strongly recommend it's a great read um so that kind of answers the question about finding out more as well yes, so yeah. you know and I think um you know in a, in in an age today uh where we are increasingly learning about these fascinating women in history I think having Henrietta as a fascinating woman in her own right uh not just a sort of mistress of the king as she's often yeah. described is so important Good. And I think this would be a good uh, closing question. You mentioned the modern day and, and one of the questions which came in very early on was about um, it, 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 what the, uh, her modernity. Um, she, she was always struck me as a thoroughly modern woman well ahead of her time. Um, do you ever daydream about what sort of woman she might be in the 21st century? Would she have been some sort of cultural critic? Oh or using the freedoms we take for granted today to do something really rather different? That is such a good question. I always think I'd like her. And there's a wonderful thing about having surviving correspondence that you can spend days almost living in that world. But if we transported her to ours, I think she would have loved the opportunities that she would have been given today in comparison to the 18th century. Um, and perhaps some more of the freedoms that she had. And I like the idea of her being a critic. I could see her writing in a paper and <laughs> all being you know, involved in the arts and yeah, drawing yeah. together great poets and theatrics and things yeah. like that. So very easy to begin Having to- Having their own late night arts programme. That would be brilliant. I would watch it. <laughs> the Henrietta Howard show. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you. I think that's a wonderful moment to end on. And as we, as, as I, I sort of uh, offer a vote of thanks on your behalf to uh, to Megan for such a wonderful talk, this is a, a good moment for Megan also to to thank you for joining us, to let you know about the other talks in the series, 
And also to say, you know, if you, if, if you want to support English heritage at Marble Hill, um, do please donate. And I hope to see some of you again tomorrow and later this week. Thank you so much, Megan Leyland. Goodbye.